Welcome to the Anxiety Guy podcast. This is episode number 142. I'm Dennis Simsek, and this is the hashtag Ask the Anxiety Guy show, where you ask the questions on social media and via email to me, and I answer them every Thursday morning on iTunes and other directories that have podcasts on them. As well, this episode and every hashtag Ask the Anxiety Guy show episode will be on YouTube every Friday morning. So make sure to subscribe, hit the bell for all the notifications for all my videos. Warriors, welcome. Your questions matter. You're listening to the Ask the Anxiety Guy show. This podcast episode is brought to you by the End the Anxiety Program, a downloadable CBT-based program created by the Anxiety Guy himself to help heal your emotional distress and put anxiety behind you once and for all. Visit www.anxietyexit.com to learn more today. Warriors. Today we're tackling suicidal thoughts, a very heavy subject that I'm grateful to be able to answer for people that are asking me for my suggestion. As well, I've got a massive headache from two drinks, two drinks. I had two alcoholic beverages just a few days ago, and there was no coconut water, so Comment below on YouTube if you're the kind of person that has put drinking behind them all together, alcoholic beverages, and gets that hangover feeling after like one or two drinks. It's a little bit sad in a way, but again, the system doesn't like it. Doesn't like it. It's not used to it. It's not familiar. Where's the coconut water? So, yeah. And then... I'm going to update a little bit on one of my personal sessions that I had with someone via Skype. And during the session with this person, I want to point out that it felt like I was talking my client into change. This is not right. It was almost like for every suggestion or solution, there was a but and a what if. And this man had struggled with anxiety for many years. And he got to the point where he came to me and he said, Dennis, I'm dissatisfied with living the way I am. Help me. But he didn't get to a point where he had that conversation with himself to say that I need to turn one way of reacting in a what-if manner to another way of reacting in a what-if manner. And this is very important because nobody can convince you to change. You have to convince you to change. So it starts here. You know, there's so many people out there that are trying the next technique or, Dennis, what's the best supplement or whatever. But you got to have that talk with you yourself to say, it's, up, it's on me. I've created this emotional distress. I've created it consciously a little bit, unconsciously a lot. And it's up to me to change it. These are conditioned into you. This is a program, first of all. Let's understand that, okay? I'm not a big fan of the word mental illness. I'd rather see you as a program, kind of like a downloadable program or an app on your cell phone. If you've downloaded the app of anxiety where you perceive internal challenges and external challenges as being life-threatening, disastrous, and you engage in catastrophic thinking, this is a program, okay? I don't care what anybody else tells you. If you look at it as a program, as a conditioned way of responding to things and a conditioned way of thinking, you have the power to change it. 
If you see it as a part of your identity, your personality, and your character, you have very little opportunity to change what you're currently going through. It's something that you're doing. It's thinking. It's behaving. It's acting. It's imagining. It's not who you are. Two completely different planets. Which planet are you on? So let's get into question number one. Question number one comes from Michael Clark via email. Michael, thanks for the email. Dennis, and this is heavy. Dennis, I have a fear of suicide during moments of great anxiety. He continues by saying, firstly, I just want to clear up that I do not have these tendencies at all and would never even consider this as an option while thinking rationally. So while he's thinking rationally, these sorts of intentions, these sorts of ways of thinking and perceiving don't show up. It's just that when I get hit with anxiety, rationality goes out the window and my thoughts are so intrusive and irrational, it really scares me after the event that these thoughts even popped up in the first place. So let's get into this. These are my suggestions. These are my two cents. First of all, let me add that anything related to suicidal thoughts or intentions are heavy. These are things that you have to take seriously because if the program continues within you, these sort of thoughts and interpretations will not get better. They will get worse. So you need to do something and you need to recognize things that are happening, certain cycles in your life, ways of thinking and ways of perceiving your past and the things that you're going through and also what your future is going to look like. So there's got to be an evaluation as to where this is coming from. Now, suicidal thoughts and images are a sign, in my opinion, are a sign of neglect or overuse by the subconscious mind. It's either you're neglecting parts of your life or you're overdoing other parts. It's almost like a signal from your subconscious that something is out of whack, something is off balance in your life. And we can interpret these suicidal thoughts that show up in any way we choose. The question is, is how can we interpret it so that we can change it, so that we've got some options here? I'll give you an example. When I used to have suicidal thoughts run through my mind consistently because of my anxiety disorder, I realized that I rarely ever, ever spent any time being conscious over what I was putting in my body, food, nutrition-wise. That was one thing. The other thing was that I was very, very antisocial. When somebody asked me to come over to their place, to hang out for a little bit, to have some discussions, to have a tea date, whatever it was, I I did everything I could to run away from that occurrence. So my subconscious started to say, hey, there are parts of your life that are out of balance and we need to balance those things out. Funny enough, when I began to place myself in conversational situations with people and I became more conscious of what I was putting in my body, strangely enough, those suicidal thoughts and tendencies disappeared. So this is interesting. And when I coach people, I find that this is quite consistent along the entire line. The other thing is that You have to understand anxiety sufferers value their lives tremendously. They value their lives tremendously. Whether it's trying to fit in and say the right thing with someone, whether it's trying to make sure that the work they're putting in has great detail behind it so that their boss is thoroughly happy or to value your life so much that you have health anxiety, hypochondria, you don't want to leave this planet, so you fear the next physical ailment. You value your life so much that the suicidal thoughts are a reflection of something else happening. I don't believe that anxiety sufferers, at least the majority of them, would even consider 
taking their own lives. They value it way too much. They care way too much. Now, along this line, perceiving anxiety differently is important. Okay, Anxiety is a challenge to a means. All right, It's a challenge right now to a means. It's an opportunity to become more. I see it as a challenge to pass through, to truly meet the goals for your life. So let's go a little bit deeper into this and understand that everybody's got goals, whether you're consciously aware of them or unconsciously something shows up and says, you know, I could be so much more. I could contribute so much more. I could love my family so much more. I could just be so much more of a person. And so that's a goal. That's a goal, whether it's on paper or in your head, preferably on paper. Everybody has goals. Now, along the timeline that is our lives, in order to become those goals, in order to become those goals, there will be challenges. And whether you believe that God is nature or God is Jesus or God is Muhammad or God is anything, you have to understand that your God, okay, your source is throwing these challenges at you so that you can grow. When you do grow, the goals, as far as the light at the end of the tunnel, gets a lot brighter. You got to understand this. We have to start seeing anxiety differently. Anxiety, like I mentioned, anxiety is an opportunity to become more. Everybody's going through something. Everybody's going through something. So I hope I've tackled that a bit, Michael. It's really important that we take this subject really seriously. But again, I believe it's a sign of neglecting something in your life or overdoing something that the system doesn't necessarily agree with as far as making you happy. Okay? So tackle it. Number two. From Instagram, Andrea underscore Wilson 19. Hi, Dennis. I have a question for the podcast. How do you deal with anxiety knowing you have a chronic illness? Would love if you could answer me through this as well as the podcast. Let's get into it. Now, she's got an illness. I'm not exactly sure what it is, um, but let's tackle it. First of all, Let's understand that a physical illness is most likely the result of an overwhelmed energetic body that carries with it past emotional traumas stored and core beliefs related to fear and negativity. Okay, so in my research, my opinion, and my ability to help people find solutions to the problems, the distresses in their lives. I've seen this over and over and over again. The ability for people to see their physical body problems as a problem within the energetic body, meaning what are we hanging on to? What are we hanging on to? Now, we may be conscious of what we're hanging on to, or the subconscious mind could let us know in different ways. It could let us know through organ failure. It could let us know through sensations of anxiety. It could let us know through repetitive, repetitive, reflexive ways of thinking about things. No matter what, the conscious mind screams and the unconscious mind whispers until it's too heavy. That's what we call physical illness. The illness should be drive for proper self-care, though, because energy is stagnant in the body, and it's our job to recognize it and get it flowing again. Because in the Western world, it's all messed up. It really is. I mean, I I don't even know where to start. Because the way we handle physical ailments is a disaster in most cases. And living in the East now, I see, I see and I believe that 
there are different ways to approach this. And in the East, they approach it from an energetic standpoint. And this is important. Now, healing the energetic body many times helps the physical body tap into its own healing system. I personally would get proactive and tackle my halt before I go looking elsewhere. Halt meaning, and this is where you got to start, H is for hunger. Okay, what are you putting in your system and how often? A is anger. What sort of things are still making you angry currently about the world and about your past and everything that happened? Let's clear those up through emotional reframing and other ways. L is loneliness, meaning how deep are your connections with people? How's your social life? How much love do you have for the people around you? And T is tiredness. How tired are you? Sleep-wise, do you take naps? Do you meditate? Do you give back to yourself in some ways? Start with your halt, and let's take it from there. Question number three comes from Jason Sades. It's an email. I'm at my wit's end with panic attacks due to the fear of the next big one, Dennis. What's the best response to panic in the moment? Please help me. Firstly, Jason, why are you thinking of what to do during a panic attack when you should be thinking of how to create enough mental and emotional momentum in order to not have an attack in the first place? Why are so many people concerned about what to do during a panic attack when in fact... They should be concerned about the momentum that they're building from the morning to the moment of that panic attack. We have to start here. Vibrational momentum in your thinking, in your perceiving, in your interpretations, in your habits, in your routines and rituals each and every day, the stuff your energetic body is hanging on to. This sort of stuff leads to something. A panic attack doesn't show up out of the blue. A panic attack is a result of something else. There's an external stimuli that you're not even aware of. And it's behind you. (laughs) Maybe it's on the side. Maybe it's in front of you. It doesn't matter. Your system will pick up on it. It'll notice the pink painting in the corner and go, Hey, that's the same pink painting that we had that massive attack just a couple weeks ago. That must mean that there's a threat again around the corner. The pink painting is the saber-toothed tiger. But to answer your question, the best response to a panic attack is no response at all. Now, this is easier said than done, but it's true. I'm so sick and tired of all the different techniques and formulas and garbage that's out there when in fact the best thing that they should be teaching you during a panic attack is how do you talk to yourself? What's your internal self-talk like? What's your speed like? When you start speeding up, you're sending certain signals to your nervous system that yes, there is danger. When you slow down, and you recognize that this is panic, all of a sudden, you're sending different signals to your nervous system. The best response to a panic attack is no response at all. Just do everything that you're currently doing. You're at the mall, and you're looking at Legos? Keep looking at Legos, right? I mean, someone might look at you and go, hey, you kind of flushed. Yeah, because I'm having a panic attack, but whatever and so on. Now, I've got different techniques. Of course I do. I've got skills. I've got tips. I could talk about this subject all day long. But the truth is, is that you've got to convince your nervous system that this place, this environment is a safe place. There is no danger. There is no threats. And once you have convinced it, and you know how to convince it, because you do and think and react the opposite manner than you're currently doing, reacting, and thinking. My friends, that's the show this week. I hope you've enjoyed it. The quote of the week. Take this with you now. Stop pushing away your voice of reason and who you truly want to become because of your inner need 
to please others. This is huge. And for all the YouTube warriors, comment below. This is the question of the week. Do you connect worry to safety? And if you do, in what way? I love you all so very much. You are more than anxiety. I'll see you soon. Warriors, remember, you are more than anxiety. You keep asking the questions, and I'll keep answering them.